the soul of epic. A million legends lie, awake and reimagined by people passing by. I feel you heroes, wild waves, epic legends live, storytellers tales. Ronwin and Woodywell, Merlin's magic might, Shinnaman's great beauty, the Yellow's birds fight. You become a legend and tell her of the tales. When you find your epic, deep in the soul of Wales. <laughs> that sadly wasn't one of my films, but it's become somehow traditional that I show a Wait, video. What's the name of that, the video? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> no way! <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> God, he's always butting in. Right, let's just get rid of him. It's somehow become traditional that I show a film at some point in tag to do with Welsh legends and uh, representation. Um, and that's the best one I've actually ever found. So there we go, that's, that's the latest one. Um, coming out of uh, Welsh Government and Tourism to advertise Year of Legends 2017. It's the second in the series of four themed years. We've had a Year of Adventure in 2016. Um, we've had that Year of Legends. We're about to have Year of the Sea and then we've got Year of Discovery in 2019. How the country is to be branded in 2020 remains to be disclosed. <laughs> the aim is consistent with that which Emily and Philip articulated in our session, Abstract, uh, to simultaneously reference the past, make sense of the present and permit projections into the future, creating a platform for memory, place and the creation and maintenance of identities. Personally, I think this is a wonderful idea, but then I might be a little biased because I work with Welsh legends. Other people have been less keen. A letter in the Cambrian News, my local rag, proclaimed recently that uh, the constant appropriation of Welsh legends for financial gain is demeaning. We are better than that. For the record, I am not better than that. If anybody would like to pay me for my work on Welsh legends, that would be great. <laughs> Doing what has always been done, that is, capitalising on stories which are embedded in the landscape, evoking time past, present and future, may well be a modern form of archaeological bardism. It's geomyth making performativity. To some people, though, it is, as this gentleman put, simply turning the country into a theme park. But if it helps to promote and protect the land, Joining up different temporalities of perceived value whilst bringing in revenue to what is, particularly in Ceredigion, one of the most poverty-ridden areas in the UK, then to my mind, it's a great scheme, especially with the universal credit breathing fire and the sorry demise of European funding. Some local authorities and businesses around Wales have done a sterling job of representing their heritage and archaeology through this medium, with regionally sensitive yet outward-looking innovation you want to look for the hashtags uh, Gullard, Gullard and find your epic. Other areas have been less effective despite having expertise within their space. For as much as this year of umbrella may sound simple, it's actually rife with pitfalls because if different processes and phenomena become apparent at different scales of observation, there can be no single unified history, only a multi-scalar one written from many different points of view. And when one point of view is the one holding the purse strings, that's the one that everybody hears. Presenting a nuanced narrative that absorbs the inherent emiketic divides or ontological divide, if you believe in such things, that multi-scale of awareness contains is often the task of heritage practitioners who have to translate across interpretations. But what happens? when public practice overrides all offerings from empirical observation, when emergent waves of tangible data and expert opinion are deliberately rejected in the resilient maintenance of an ideological appropriation of place and time. If an expert speaks in a forest and nobody remembers, <coughs> did the research happen? For in a pragmatic joust between information and ideology, fact and faux fact Sadly, faux facts have a habit of coming up um, trump. 
<laughs> I was going to give you an example at this point in relation to my ongoing project, Layers in the Landscape, but in the last three weeks, a new modern GMF has emerged in exactly the same locale. So I'm going to tell you about that instead. It takes the form of a proposal for public art. What has public art got to do with archaeological theory? Well, it's a fair question, but this particular proposal takes the shape of a nine metre high bronze steel tree designed to stand in the sea at high tide. The aim being to draw attention to the intersections of remembering and forgetting through situated archaeology, a sculpted comment on climate change and notions regarding the architecture of forgetting in a place which will be subject to managed retreat from 2050-50. So this particular stretch of liminality will soon be deliberately allowed to flood. The location also happens to be the submerged forest of Borth, where much of my own work is situated. You might be able to make out the tree stumps in some of the pictures. It's about two years ago now that the artist in question, Robert Davis, approached myself and, and Martin Bates in order to garner information about whether this archaeology was actually an archaeologically sound venture or not. We had a lot of questions, such as exactly where in the forest it would, it would be positioned, at what depth, what length of time would it remain, the intention being for it to weather and wear for a decade or so with the sea washing back and forth around its trunk, as if it were one of the lost oaks or pine, whose trunks are now but sorrowful and fleeting reminders of land before sea some 4,000 years ago. As such, tree would embody time, the impermeability of man-made structure, and direct people's attention to the layers beneath the footprints in the sand, providing a striking visual comment about the forest, which mostly lies hidden, so hidden in fact, that many locals don't even realise how large it is. And they even don't realise that the town is built on top of it. So when they walk down the high street, they're walking on top of trees. Martin answered the scientific challenges that came up in this discussion, um, which would be involved sort of positing issues that would need addressing later, um, and some immediately before anything could be put in the public domain. And I offered a SciArt agreement in favour, along with quietly predicting the <coughs> likely local response. I suggested it would be a mixed bag, but that the loudest comment would undoubtedly be in the form of opposition, mostly from other people who claimed to be artists too, who would not want their current vista from which some of them make their living altering. A position with which I was, and still am, sympathetic. My experience with the local tourist outputs was such that I felt confident that however well designed the project, however scientifically and socially valuable and valid it was, however much it tied to the Welsh Government directive, there would still be those who would reject all evidence in favour of their preferred, idealised and highly transient perception of the landscape. Local identity in both, predominantly from incomers, one way or another, has been founded upon a reuse of the past within the past in the form of Cantra Gwaelod, a myth of neg really negligible historiosity, which is commonly asserted to be socially situated memory about inundation from 1250, but which is actually reliant upon an active process of forgetting both the source of the modern story, which is roughly actually only a couple of hundred years old, like the town itself, and also a disinclination to remember that scientific data proves it to be untrue. By which I mean people are in love with myths about myths. They're in love with memory and time the way they want memory and time to be. And in my experience, they often struggle when their idealised architecture of place is challenged. Rob is not one of those sorts of people, and so most of Martin's points were taken on board and he put together a watertight and inspiring argument. In February <coughs> 2016, he approached the local council about a tree, and in March they discussed it at an official meeting. June saw a public consultation. People were encouraged to spread the word and to make contact regarding any concerns. Rob was open, transparent, and thorough in following things up in person. There were posters, house calls, more consultations, a website, but response was oddly muted. There were some objections, but there was a huge amount of support. 
I won't go through the machinations involved in the formal application. Suffice to say that it was complicated and lengthy, resulting in an almost final planning meeting being booked for December 1st this year. That's a full 22 months after first telling local residents about the idea, in which time they had full access to all of the data concerned. Then, in the middle of November, a petition suddenly appeared. This petition encouraged people to sign their names in protests based upon four points, these being roughly as follows. That the location conflicted within the SLA1 status that claims to protect and enhance the landscape, safety issues, access, that the installation works would involve significant and unwarranted damage to the submerged forest and disruption to the beach due to the use of heavy machinery. It's a very compelling case. However, it isn't true. A full summary of the hows and whys of this can be found in my blog. The clock ironically forbids me from exploring them in as much detail here as, as I would like. You have to take me on expert trust. At this point in the saga, it's worth noting that I was still largely on the fence about tree. Uh, I could see that it had scientific merits. It'd be enormously useful to get access to a sedimentary sequence that lies beneath the forest, which is no more than a metre um, below the surface. And this would be an exceptional opportunity to do exactly what the SLA1 status encourages, that is to add to our education regarding the phenomenological passage of time. I was also very comfortable regarding the safety of the forest for this particular endeavour. Unlike with the sea defences which had gone on the year before and the Welsh waterworks which occurred earlier this year with only a desktop assessment as far as we can tell. The former destroyed hundreds of square metres of forest which did get recorded and the latter involved digging through it into where we think there's an earlier channel which didn't get recorded. The same channel on which the both antlers were found. And this is an incredibly fragile and important environment, an opportunity that was completely missed, despite attempts. In trees, instance, the area <coughs> is not fragile and what little would be damaged, approximately 2.5 square metres, would be correctly recorded and kept as evidence, etc., etc., long after the forest was returned to the sea. Out of professional curiosity, due to what looked like an innocent misunderstanding of the facts, in this petition, I took to surveying the objective's public Facebook page. And oh, what research wonders did I find? If you're interested in the epistemology of scientific communication, take a look. Any thoughts that I had that objectors didn't know the facts behind the claims or had simply forgotten them, was rapidly shattered. Although it certainly applied to a minority. Even when the scientific facts were presented in a clear and reasonable manner, repeatedly by a wide range of people, they were rejected, forgotten, perhaps, in favour of a new complaint. At one point, Martin was even described as being dishonest because he was purporting a professional opinion from his position as an official consultant. This behaviour, distressingly, was also what happened at the planning meeting. I walked up along with a whole load of neutrally situated people and equally sized group of avid supporters and my dog. There were more objectors present than, than we were and it became rapidly clear that this was because many of the supporters were in work. For some of us this was work. The proceedings were very fairly chaired. Objectors were given a chance to speak their grievances which included the petition in which people had been incited to sign on false grounds. Expansive claims were made about speaking on behalf of the community, despite many members of the self-same community arguing back that they could speak for themselves as supporters. Likewise, claims were made about standing up for the petrified forest, a forest which is not petrified and which they couldn't even accurately locate around them. Responses were aired from the defence and every single alleged objection was proven to be unfounded every last one. Whereas the protesters were largely unqualified in any of the areas, the people in defence were highly qualified. Now that does not give one side more right to speak than another, but it does give some context from which they're speaking. 
the experts were people who understood time, landscape, memory, art and commemoration, but mostly didn't live there. Nobody would, who spoke would benefit financially from tree apart from the objectors. What became very clear as those against heckled and took up divisive tactics was that attempts were being made to defend personal aesthetic with science, when no science reasons against it existed, and when in fact there were substantial science and heritage and economic reasons in favour. So instead of being happy when the concerns were resolved, they got actually more agitated. And one of the recurring comments was that it was all right to destroy protected heritage if it was for a useful purpose. By this they meant that sea defences, which had been put in place to protect their houses with large machinery, which tree wouldn't use, and in so doing have des destroyed a large swathe of forest, and also the Welsh waterworks. So one form of what I see as geoecological vandalism had been employed to stop water and another to bring water in, but a piece of art that was there to talk about water was unacceptable. Granted, these things that have been done were useful, are useful for the people who will have another almost four decades to live, visit and work on top of the forest. But it isn't useful for anybody else, all long term, if we're going to consider long term impact. Unlike information about climate change, unlike scientific research, unlike bringing income, unlike education, unlike creating a, a memorialisation of a place that is about to disappear. Besides, if we're going to argue that art isn't useful and only usefulness is of value, then that elevates the value of the scientific supporters and invalidates the assumed value of many of the protesters, and that's a slippery slope into a very unpleasant place. Some voices maintained that they liked the idea, but just not the location. Waiting for a tree instead to be placed on dry land, which would rather miss the point of the whole idea. The lack of conceptual grasp was exacerbated by objectors mapping the tree in the wrong place, with nice formal looking bollards, so that it appeared to be correct. Assertions were also made that there had been insufficient public consultation, and that the proposal, proposal had been sneaked in under noses, under the noses of the same people who were at the public consultations I referred to earlier, who we have photographs of, <laughs> and who had access to myself and Martin as public figures who work in this very precise intersection between art and archaeology in that very place where I'd had an exhibition that very summer talking about trees and flooding at which I spoke to these people access which they hadn't taken advantage of. Not one single a person approached either of us with opposition. Plenty of other people did. Additionally, there were accusations of arrogance towards Rob the artist, considering it an affront to make a bold statement of this kind. I suppose there's arguments that all art is arrogant. So there's a point there. He lives in a neighbouring village. So what right had he, or as experts who live further south in the same county, to have any opinion regarding their locality? I sympathise with that feeling, and the, the feeling that tree would be forced on them. That made me uncomfortable too. But then I feel like that about most man-made structures, and um, that includes the town. Considering, however, that in knowing nothing, one knows more than a professional, and that one's temporary vista, a sculpture would be in place for only 10 years, is more important than climate change, dialogue, education and economics, are not themselves exactly without a little bit of arrogance. I could go on, but I won't. The crux is that when people are presented with information that contradicts the narrative to which they are committed, their ability to forget <coughs> contradictory information is substantial, even in the moment, especially when egged on by group thought and emotions are running high. Scaling such ideological time is not for the faint-hearted, however big one's key might be. The upshot of this saga, as of Wednesday last week, is that despite overwhelming levels of support all the way through the proposal and all the expert bodies having passed it, at the last permission hurdle, it fell. Why? 
Well, in the public domain, it is stated as being for totally unsubstantiated reasons. We have spoiling the natural environment. This is an environment that is entirely man-made. It's already a theme park constructed from groins, myth and defences dating back 200 years, made even more unnatural now since the last interference, the changes from which are beginning to show. And, of course, we have the petition. The petition that was founded on untruths, untruths, the truths of which were easily accessible. Many people who signed the petition did so in good faith, having been misled. Alternative facts have therefore been given precedence over expert opinion, and the desire to cling to an imagined past and an insular present has overthrown engagement with the future. And that, I think, has been a familiar theme for many of us during both 2016 and 2017. But it yet remains to be seen if time's passing commemorates it as legendary. Thank you for listening. <laughs>